um, that there is a very sort of clear distinction between the left and the right. So that, for example, the, uh, in recent years, there's been a small band of Labour MPs who were opposed to Blair's wars. And of course, we had the uh, recent uh, example of the heroic uh, 11 Labour MPs who put forward a statement on the war in Ukraine. Uh, I use heroic in, in uh, quotation marks because they were then put under pressure to withdraw that statement. So it's often sort of seen that uh, Labour is, uh, is a party which is sort of divided on these questions. And indeed its history is more progressive, that its left is much more important. Now, what I'm going to argue is that uh, this actually is not only the case, but this, um, these sort of legends that grew up around the Labour Party often obscure not only the nature of the Labour Party, but of its left. And um, I think we've seen examples of that quite recently. Now, this is quite a wide ranging topic. And uh, if I dealt with it uh, in the detail that I would like, probably my opening uh, would, would range to about three to four hours. Um, and I would like to go for the Fidel Castro uh, world record and try and beat that, but I'm not sure that you would go for the same record as the audience and that you might, in that famous phrase, vote with your feet by the time I got to the 1930s. So I'm going to take what I think is an important uh, part, aspect, which is the foundation of the Labour Party in the years up to um, 1914 into the, into the First World War, but I'm also going to consider that post-war uh, Labour government, the one that's often sort of seen as, you know, the best Labour government, the Labour government, the, the 45-51 uh, government, um, and, and talk a little bit there, both about the left and the government's policy. So that should uh, while away uh, a good hour or more, I think. The other thing I think we need to remember, I don't think anyone would forget it, but I think it is important to begin uh, any survey like this, is that the 122 year history of the Labour Party has been a history of um, um, uh, imperialist war. It's been a, a, a century of counter revolution and of course, great revolutionary events. The Russian Revolution of 1917, the two world wars, the, uh, the ending of European empires, the collapse of dynasties, and of course, the, the rise in new powers and new geopolitics towards the end of, of that period. So what we're talking about is, uh, is a, you know, a really quite turbulent period. And I don't want to suggest a sort of, um, uh, you know, undue continuity. I think there are dynamics and I think there are political reasons to identify, say, Ramsay MacDonald with, uh, with, with, with Tony Blair or Ramsay MacDonald and some members of the Labour left. I think we can make those identifications, but I think we must also be aware of the differences, particularly in the earlier period when, uh, and I'll take Ramsay MacDonald as a good example, MacDonald in the First World War adopts uh, a broadly social pacifist position. And because social pacifism is seen as being on the left, MacDonald uh, gets a reputation for being a left winger, which is going to be quite useful for him when he becomes the Labour leader. And the same with a number of other people who adopt a similar sort of social pacifist position. Some of them are politically uh, on, on the Labour right, people like Philip Snowden. And in that, I think there's a similarity to uh, something that Comrade said um, in one of the other sessions about the split in the SPD, and particularly that someone like Bernstein, who was a, a revisionist and you know, clearly on the far right of the SPD, uh, was in the USPD and took that particular position. So we're, we're in a period when uh, you know, political positions, I suppose, are still unclear. And I think in some ways what clarifies them, not just on questions of war and peace, but actually I think really, really across the whole range of uh, politics is of course the Russian revolution, which is a very clear dividing line 
on how we understand socialism, the role of the working class and the capitalist state. So there's a real dividing line. Quite a lot of people before that revolution and before the debates about that revolution can in fact be quite left. And the, the, the division, they can talk about socialism and they can even talk about revolution. But when you have a real revolution right in front of you, and you've got a, a, you know, an attempt to build a, a socialist society, workers' power and so forth, then you then have to take a stand on that. And that sort of fuzziness, particularly uh, as we know from the movement internationally, that sort of centrism, you know, there isn't really, I think, uh, there's still a place for it, but the borderlines are now much, uh, are now much clearer in that way. The other, uh, the other point I would just throw in as well, uh, again, I don't, it, it should come out, I think, in the talk, is that there's a very clear relationship as well between domestic policy and foreign policy between the Labour Party and indeed other parties' policies uh, in relation to war, relation to peace, in relation to empire. And that's not just, um, that's not just sort of electoral politics, but, but empire and uh, war and our approach to it, again, are often quite central, particularly in this earlier period, pardon me, in this earlier period when Britain is uh, a, an imperial power. Again, I think, you know, comrades know this, and, but the reason why I want to sort of bring it home is that if you read debates about imperial policy or about war policy and foreign policy, it invariably reflects some sort of debate go, going on, both, say, within a party or within a class, or, you know, more importantly, within the ruling circles. And the relationship between how we conduct ourselves uh, internationally and domestically, uh, I, I think is, you know, cannot be separated. So I want to just talk briefly about the origins and the nature of the Labour Party in the, um, in the early 1900s. Um, Labour becomes a clearly potential governing party in the uh, middle 1920s, it forms a minority government in 23, 24. It also has a spelling government in 29 to 31. Um, so what we're looking at is the trajectory of Labour as a, a party moving from its earliest formation in 1900 to uh, a governing party. Again, for it, it's useful even for comrades from Britain to understand this, that the origins of Labour are really very different from most uh, continental social democratic parties. And it, it has a very clear difference ideologically. There are Marxist elements, uh, Marxist groupings, uh, comrades who were present for Lawrence Parker's talk yesterday on the British Socialist Party will, will be aware of that. But in general, the uh, organizational form of labor was as a federation of both trade unions, that's where the main impetus comes from, and then socialist groupings, independent labor party, social democratic federation, and the Fabians. And those groupings, uh, again, within the ILP, uh, there are some people who claim to be Marxist, but ideologically, the politics of labor are representational of the trade union movement. They essentially want an electoral and a parliamentary representation to secure concessions for the unions. So that's the main impetus. And the, the impetus is particularly around a series of legal decisions that have been taken in the 1890s and the early 1900s. Ideologically, many of the first Labour MPs, and indeed I'd say the dominant ideology both in the unions and even in the ILP, is a form of liberalism. And this isn't just a sort of swear word that the left use. These people are clearly liberals. They are closer to the left wing of the Liberal Party. They're very influenced by um, what we might call Gladstonian liberalism or what will later be new liberalism. And this is very important when we come to foreign policy, because there is 
a, a trend. It's it's um, it's often anti-imperialist with a quotation marks. For example, many liberals were quite hostile to the idea of empire, particularly amongst uh, rank and file liberals. And there is a there is a type of little Englandism, an idea that British capitalism should develop. Uh, in a sense, entire within itself, and that the empire is uh, a, a distraction and expense. And in a writer like J.A. Hobson, who is around this current, who later joins the ILP, imperialism is seen as a sort of parasitic growth on capitalism. So a sort of anti-imperialism often linked with a sort of a, a opposition to what are seen as the reactionary forces particularly landlordism and aristocracy, is very much part of the radical liberal tradition. And, and again, you can see the way that that could be attractive to the left. Um, when, I, when Engels is referring to landlordism in Ireland, he's you know, speaking in, an, in a sort of language that many people would understand. So when it comes to war, many of the people who are considering questions of war, war and peace in 1914 are not doing this from any sort of Marxist position, not even a sort of pseudo or a centrist Marxist position. They're doing it in terms of opposition from sort of pacifistic and in, indeed in many liberal, uh, liberal ways. The, the Liberal Party, although... Um, generally united behind the war, did have resignations from the cabinet in 1914. And, you know, there's, there's clearly uh, some sort of differences with inside elements of the British ruling class and the Liberal Party on that. I'm not particularly concerned with that at this stage, but what I suppose I want to emphasise is that Labour ideologically is closer to liberalism, I think, than, than, than the Marxism, even the formal Marxism, of people in uh, continental social democracy. But uh, this, this labor formation has been called, I think quite accurately by Lenin and by others, and we still use that formulation, a bourgeois workers party. And by that, we mean that it's leadership, both in terms of ideology and in the contemporary world is very much part of the bourgeois state. Its overwhelming characteristic is loyalty, not just to capitalism, but loyalty to the constitutional order. So it's loyal to the British state, which in 1914 is going to be the British Empire. So uh, the, the Labour leadership, uh, even if it takes a, a, an anti-war position, does not do that from any sort of revolutionary politics. It does it that the interests of the British state and through that of the working class, as they would see it, are best served by staying out of this war. So when we read some of these statements, and I will try and read some of them uh, a little later, we have to bear that in mind, that these are people who um, stand on the basis of constitutional loyalty, which means that from the very beginning, Labour is, is very much a battleground, but it's always within a framework of that constitutional order. So even the, even the ILP, which at this stage is the predominant section of the left, still has the argument, still has a strategy of capturing the capitalist state, taking uh, control of the state as an instrument for purposes of social reform and improvement. So it's not a case of smashing the state, it's not a case of alternative uh, forms of working class power, it's actually seeing the state as an instrument, I suppose a vehicle, a bit like a car, you, you get control of the key, you jump in and you drive it in the particular direction in that way. So this is what I think the Labour left uh, in this period, and I would suggest, perhaps even more importantly today, share in terms of their attitude towards the state. So the difference, I think, between the left and the right here is one of degree, rather than simple, you know, left and right, complete opposition, and so on. And that means that when we, when we, um, when we come across some of these statements and we think, oh, that sounds far to the left, we have to think of that context. 
So when somebody like Ramsay MacDonald um, in 1914, when the First World War is in the process of uh, you know, breaking out, is talking about protest demonstrations and signs a manifesto with Arthur Henderson to organize demonstrations against the war, he says he's working within the 1907 Stuttgart Conference uh, Congress position. But that doesn't mean he wants to turn the world war into a civil war. For him, you know, the real enemy is not at home in that sense. For him, the war is a disaster, and it's a disaster for the British state, and it's a disaster for his particular politics. So his type of pacifism is, um, is a product, as I've said, of this particular ideology, but it's also one that can very easily sort of fit in within the context of the Labour Party. Henderson is also able to work within this framework, and yet Henderson goes into the cabinet in 1915, and as I never tire of telling anybody, um, and I must get this one in first, he sits in the cabinet which is um, carried, ca authorizes the execution of uh, James Connolly and the Irish rebels in Dublin uh, in, in May 1916. So that his idea of international solidarity, which he's talking about about two years earlier, is, um, is sitting in a, a warmongering cabinet that's sending uh, millions of people to their deaths and repress repressing uh, the Easter Rising. So we can see the sort of flabby nature of this, but we can also see the very clear interests that the Labour leadership have in the constitutional order and the support of that uh, constitutional order. Um, the, other, the other key point, I think, about this period as well, this is where the domestic and the, the, the foreign, in a sense, interlink, is that Labour in the First World War throws itself solidly behind the war effort. Although there are a number of resignations from the front bench of prominent Labour leaders like MacDonald and like Snowden, um, the bulk of the trade union backed uh, MPs um, take part and support the war. But more importantly, they encourage the unions and the working class to, to get solidly behind that war. So they, um, they function um, in, the, in the words of, I think, Sidney Webb, who again is certainly no revolutionary, they function as diplomatic emissaries from the government to the working class. And they attempt to integrate the working class into the war effort, encouraging uh, people not to strike. The union leaders call an industrial truce. The Labour Party calls an electoral truce. And so what this does is to consolidate a process, which I think has always been there from the beginning of the Labour Party, but it really consolidates it, which is to integrate the Labour Party into the state. The British trade unions, although their, their, their legal position, their legality and their, their strong legal position had only really been, um, uh, I, I suppose, not guaranteed, but established in the 1870s, um, had long had a tradition of bargaining, had long had a tradition of working with the state. It was quite usual for trade union officials to go from being a trade union official to being sort of functionaries. One of the first Labour MPs, David Shackleton, M uh, MP for Clitheroe, uh, went on to become one of the organizers, uh, civil service organizers of the national insurance team. So that sort of interplay between union leaderships and state bureaucracy wasn't unusual, but what was now being done was, I suppose, a political integration. It was making it plain that Labour was uh, completely loyal uh, in that way. Now, the ILP, which uh, forms this left grouping that I've, uh, I've talked about, its uh, hostility to the war, I think, was often ideologically expressed in forms of pacifism. And that actually drew it towards sections of the Liberal Party. Many of, many of the, these individuals would, in the course of the next 10, 20 years or so, go over to the Labour Party. 
So again, they're, they're working within the same sort of ideological framework. They, um, they draw on some of the, the critiques that Hobson had made about uh, imperialism, and they attribute the war to secret diplomacy. They talk about the role of arms manufacturers. They talk about the lack of democratic control of foreign policy. And um, they, they form a grouping, the Union of Democratic Controls. They, they also key into um, some liberal currents of hostility to conscription, the No Conscription Fellowship. And also many of them, uh, for various religious and other reasons, become conscientious objectors. Now, these people are often given, I think, a, a, a great deal of promin prominence, and rightly so. Many of them are very brave. They, they undergo many privations in the jails, and you know, indeed, that many of them are ostracized when they come out of the prisons. And you know, that that idea of being a conchi hangs around for a long time. But um, that I think can be exaggerated in terms of numbers and in terms of the coherence of that position. I'm also thinking that you know, to repeat the point I made earlier about um, McDonald's, that opposition to the war was later worn as a badge by many people who were very far from being on the left. So it was probably quite a smart career move from McDonald, not that I'm accusing him of that, but it, was, it didn't do him any harm later on with the left. Um, you know, rather like voting against Blair's wars in parliament, um, you know, it, it allows you to parade that sort of uh, approach. Now, I use the phraseology of social imperialism and social passivism, and comrades, I think, would be aware of the origins of that, and that may be a, a, a point to take up in discussion. Labour, the Labour leadership, the dominant trend, uh, certainly in terms of the unions, was very clearly social imperialist. It, it could sometimes be dressed up with anti-militarism, and by militarism, that's just a coded word for Germany, because Germany is identified with Prussianism. Uh, we only have to look at the wartime propaganda to, to see that. But it's also, I think, the social imperialism of another type, which is that inside that um, support for the British war effort is not just the sort of lesser of two evils. You know, we have to support Britain because it's slightly more democratic than the Kaiserreich. There's also, I think, an argument that Britain is essentially progressive. And indeed that, 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 that empire might be progressive. I don't have time to go into this, but it is a thread and um, that is, I think, well worth exploring. There is an argument that the British Empire is somehow better than your usual empire because it's civilized and democratic. Uh, it brings education. And of course, there's a sort of developmental perspective. In fact, you might, if you read some of the pamphlets on labor and colonial government, Ramsay MacDonald wrote one, thinking about 1989, you might be forgiven for thinking that the whole purpose of the British Empire was to spread schools and hospitals throughout the world, and that it was somehow sort of an extension of, uh, you know, the welfare state. Um, you know, rather like some of the propaganda we heard in the Iraq war, the, the Afghan war, if you remember, the Afghan war was fought to free uh, Afghani women. And uh, just think of all the good things that have been done in Iraq. Uh, you know, in terms of education and so on. So the, the other argument that goes with this is, as I said, the developmental perspective, which is that Labour, if it comes to power, it said, cannot just abandon the empire. That would be irresponsible. It would be rather like, um, I mean, there's a phrase that McDonald uses. He said it's sort of rather like abandoning children. You know, they're obviously, you know, not grown up yet enough. But once they have grown sufficiently, then they can develop a mature relationship with the mother country. So there is, when, when that phrase social imperialism is used, it's not, I think, just an argument that these uh, members of the Labour Party support the empire. They do so often ostensibly from the left. <laughs>
And they do this with a much bigger empire than the, um, than, than the German uh, left, who advanced some similar arguments in terms of supporting the German war, war effort. They've got more schools and hospitals to, um, to show off as the products of uh, British imperial rule. So social imperialism, I think, is, is much wider. And it again links back to a very important strand in British society uh, in terms of support for the empire, particularly, um, you know, it's most prominent in, in Tory supporters. But um, one thing that I, uh, I came across in preparing this, and it's not a, not a source that I usually find, and it's actually from the young Fabians. Um, and um, I thought it was quite interesting because it, it, it establishes a continuity. They're the ones who are making the continuity, but not me. They wrote a pamphlet in 2014. Um, again, comrades in Britain would, would remember that there was an attempt to try to um, make the, um, the centenary of the First World War some sort of popular celebration of empire. And indeed, if, I'm, um, if I read the papers right, the, uh, the new, uh, one of the new uh, Tory ministers, Coatain, I think is likely to be pushing this one as well about the progressive nature of the British Empire. And um, so the, the Young Fabians in 2014 produced this pamphlet and it's, it's, it's one section called Labour and the First World War. So I thought, well, this is it. I won't need to do any preparation for it. Just crib from here. It's the sort of thing that speakers often, they, their eyes light up when they see that because it saves us a lot of rooting around for references. But um, it didn't do much history, but it told me a lot about the present. And uh, the young Fabians say about the history of the Labour Party in the First World War, one myth that needs busting from the get-go, must say Webb would never have written in that sort of language, it shows you how things have been on the slides since 1914. One myth that needs busting from the get-go is that Labour was and is the party of pacifism, Excellent. I think we should um, we should put that as one of our mast headings, you know, in that way. Um, and it goes on to say that um, this again is a contemporary um, a contemporary argument. It quotes a Labour MP, James O'Grady, from 1914, who said that the establishment of socialism can go hand in hand with national loyalty to king and country. Now there's, there's real so, social imperialism. James O'Grady is a Labour MP for Leeds in that period. And um, the young Fabians then print this with, uh, with pride and then go on to say, we need to um, remember the working class, conservative, patriotic, monarchical, and imperious men and women whose votes helped propel the party to power in the early 20s. And they say, we're in favor of one nation labor. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Neighbor, labor cannot allow the Tories to gain a monopoly on the union flag. I personally am quite happy to let them have it. Um, and they say, um, we need to recognize the crucial role that patriotism played in the party's rise to power. Now, there would have been a time as a sort of left labor I would have read that and bristled and said, oh, this is nonsense, rubbish. You know, left has always been a strong force. But actually, young Fabians are quite right. And that's why I think we should reprint it, because from their point of view, what they're trying to emphasize is not the left, but actually that continuity with social imperialism. So, you know, from the, from the mouths of your opponents, there does sometimes... Uh, come some sort of truth in that way. Now, the, the dividing line that I've talked about in terms of um, in terms of the Russian Revolution, I think is important. This isn't only the period, um, you know, as indeed is the whole First World War when Lenin and others are beginning to see the, the clear distinctions in, uh, in, in the working class movement. But when those distinctions are taking very clear organizational and political forms. But it is also useful, again, to sort of stress that the divisions are often 
still very muddied. And um, it's only, I think, in retrospect that they become clarified. I'm sure many comrades will be aware, and much was made of it, certainly in the 70s. Lots of people published pamphlets on it, and there were reminiscences of it. But at the famous Leeds Convention in June 1917 that welcomed the Russian Revolution, and in case any comrades getting just wondering, June 1917, did they have some advance warning of what was going to happen in the, in the autumn? It was actually the welcoming the February Revolution. And this was, a, this was a, quite a large conference of real spread of the labor movement. So Ramsay MacDonald is in attendance. Philip Snowden is going to be his chancellor in, in future labor governments, and again, another arch right winger along with, with, with other lefts who were, uh, you know, again, have, have been adopting uh, an anti-war position. This conference welcomes the Russian Revolution, as indeed many people did, the February Revolution, the overthrow of Tsarism and so on. But what it also does is to go on and welcome the establishment of Soviets. And it does so, uh, in the following terms. This is, um, this is, a, 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 this is McDonald uh, speaking, and um, he says, uh, we congratulate the Russian people on their achievement overthrowing Tsarism, and uh, they've taken a foremost part in the international movement for working class emancipation from all forms of political economic and, uh, and imperialist oppression and exploitation. Our congratulations are absolutely unstinted and un unqualified. Um, when this war broke out, organized labor in this country lost the initiative. It became a mere echo of the old governing classes. Here, here, cheers, it, it says in the record. Now the Russian Revolution has once again given you the chance to take the initiative yourselves. Um, let us lay down our terms, make our proclamations, establish our own diplomacy, see to it that we have our own international meetings. Now, my point about this is that it, it clearly has echoes of the left, but it's not calling for the, the, the imperialist war to be turned into a civil war. But it does show, I think, the ability of, of many of the social pacifists to draw on both the anti-war moods and I think more importantly, the sympathy with the Russian Revolution. But the, the other one that uh, is often quoted is the Labour MP uh, Anderson, who says uh, that we must form in every town, urban and rural districts, councils of workmen and soldiers deputies for initiating and coordinating working class uh, activity. And it, it says, if a revolution by the conquest of political power by a hitherto disinherited class, if revolution be that we are, be that, be that we are not going to put up the, put, well, it's, sorry. If revolution be that we are not going to put up in the future with what we have put up within the past, Mm. Uh, then the sooner we have revolution in this country, the better. And I, I, think, I, th I think what is interesting, again, in that is just to talk about the impact of the Russian Revolution, the way that the debate is being framed, even before 1917. Except that I think after the 1917 revolution, when the real consequences of what workers taking power, the real consequences of a Soviet regime are, many of those individuals will really resile from that, that position. Um, but even, even, even early into the, into the early 20s, the labor leaders and the trade union leaders are well uh, able to uh, play with those sorts of ideas, partly, uh, I think, because of the pressure that they're under from their own members to oppose intervention uh, to um, to stand in some form of solidarity with the with the new Soviet regime, but also interestingly, and this again, you, you have to dig a little deeper into the statements of uh, some of the lead, labor leaders. They do this because they say that intervention 
against the Soviet Union is not in the national interest. Not that it's uh, an attack upon a working class state, but as a responsible government, Labour would never get involved in a, a, an unwinnable war. It would never get involved in a, an adventurous um, warmongering expedition. So on the surface, these people are talking left, but in practice, they're already framing themselves as the responsible um, you know, agents of the ruling class. Now, I've, there's quite a lot to cover in terms of the Labour Party in government, its relationship with the empire in 23-24. Um, I'd like to talk a little more about Iraq and the, the air force in Iraq. And there's plenty on Iran um, or Persia and, and so on there. But I want, to, I want to now turn actually to what in some ways is the sort of classic touchstone for many people on the, the Labour left, and that's the 1945 Labour government. And again, um, even, even comrades who, you know, ostensibly critical of Labourism, I think are very easily sort of taken in by that government, and in particular, its foreign policies and its uh, relationship to um, uh, defence of empire. We're all, I think, aware of the radicalization in politics throughout the world that that war brought. And even, even in Britain, the war was fought primarily uh, as a war for democracy and against fascism. Uh, I mean, this is, is true in the United States as well. well. And indeed, the whole idea of the empire is sort of shoved to the back and replaced increasingly by the Commonwealth. Although I, I'm always um, I'm always amazed, and you know, as someone who's taught uh, both school pupils and university people for the last forty or so years, um, I'm always amazed at the Britain standing alone myth. Uh, you know, that Britain was somehow by itself. I, I used to blame Dad's army's opening credits for that, because um, I do make the point that the British Empire in, um, in you know, 1939 was still about a quarter of the world's, uh, you know, surface. So if Britain was alone, it had a lot of mates with it, you know, standing behind it. Above all, though, the, the war was one, I think, in which the common man, uh, and that, you know, and women, of course, increasingly uh, as well, the, the mobilization of populations. And I think um, other sort of radical democratic ideas about the nature of that war are the role of the Soviet Union. Um, I, uh, I remember from school days that I had some fairly conservative teachers. Uh, I, Jack in, earlier was talking about the LCC. Um, I think my uh, I think my teachers are probably closer to the uh, BUF, the British Union of Fascists. But um, they there were one or two of them who had unstinting um, admiration for our gallant Soviet allies, and that was the phrase that, the, that particularly my history teacher used. He always would, would sort of put that in, almost uh, like a religious invocation, you know. And let us not forget our gallant Soviet allies. Now, that I think encourages the idea that the war was, was, was primarily democratic. I think if we talk about it being an imperialist war and its relationship to imperialism, it's, it's still one of the, perhaps one of the more difficult historiographical areas to, do, to discuss with people. And so this means that the 45 government, which comes out of that period, still carries some of that idea of radicalism still carries that, that sort of um, you know, aura around it in that way. It's also important in terms of domestic policy on the left, because for many people on the, the Labour left, and I would say many comrades on the Trotskyist left, particularly those comrades who've um, you know, done a long, <laughs> long jail time in the Labour Party, um, you know, the, the, the sort of influence of this this idea of uh, the 45 government, nationalization, uh, 
being equivalent to socialism, the role of the state, that type of statism, which again feeds back to the idea that the state is a neutral instrument, is, is, is quite deeply embedded. But there's, there's also, I think, a similar idea about the, the, the foreign policy of that, um, of that government as well. Um, this morning, Simon uh, Norfolk asked, um, asked comrades to try and guess the, the picture. Um, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to see if you can guess who said this, okay? Um, the Labour Party should have a clear foreign policy of its own, which is completely distinct from that of the Tory party. The socialist revolution has already begun in Europe and has already established in many countries in Eastern... Oh, no, all right. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, finish the quote off then. <laughs> so the, the crucial principle of our foreign policy should be to protect, assist, encourage, and aid in every way that socialist revolution wherever it appears. The upper classes in every country are selfish, depraved, dissolute, and decadent. I'd had that on cue, but it's not coming. Uh, these upper classes look to the British army and the British people to protect them against the just wrath of the people who have been fighting underground against them in the past four years. The wrath didn't come and expected. We must see that that does not happen. Now, you know, Jack rather spoiled the uh, the dramatic effect there. It's okay; it won't be forgotten. Um, <laughs> but I think what's important about that is that that sort of left talk uh, is again uh, the way that even and you know Healy was already moving to the right, um, and you know by the 1950s would be an out and out you know Cold War agent working very closely with the Americans in that way. But what it does point to is a type of position on the Labour left, which does emerge in this post-war period, and I think has echoes uh, today, both in the official left, and I would say even further in groups like Stop the War. And this is, um, it's a type of third way is, um, it's a shame that other people have rather taken that title, but this is a, a position that stands between United States and the Soviet Union. And it, it does fit in with a rather exceptionalist argument about the nature of Britain. I think it also clearly has its echoes in, in what will later be the British Road to Socialism, which I think is being written in the late 40s. And it does reflect what it would, would, it be, it would be some of the influence that official communism has. But again, we can perhaps uh, discuss that. This, this third way position recognizes that, that, that Britain is now in a much weaker position, that the impact of two imperialist wars, colossal indebtedness, destruction, the weakness, so that, so that Britain as a, as a world power is now very, very much uh, on the defensive. And so what distinctive position can the left put forward? Now, the position that it puts forward is, is in a sense, a sort of moral, ethical politics, which relies on um, ideas of collective security, uh, the United Nations, in particular, when, um, when the Korean War takes place, many people in Britain back that war because of the existence of a United Nations resolution. And comrades will be well aware of, the, of all the debates in, around Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, and, and so on, and, and more recently in, on Ukraine. The role of the United Nations is often a negotiation and arbitration is often put forward as some sort of panacea by the left. So this, this does have echoes of that earlier pacifistic position. It has all those ideas of some sort of ethical foreign policy. It also has an idea that, that war and what is essentially a conflict 
I would still argue um, between the Soviet, Soviet Union, which is a distinct social system, and then capitalism, that that war, that Cold War, can in a sense be resolved by forms of negotiation, almost by moral example. It reminds me of the way that, um, you know, legends that you hear in the Middle Ages of um, monks and priests riding between two warring sides, you know, holding up the cross and persuading them to lay down their arms. It is a sort of, you know, Gandhian pacifism uh, in that sense. It's also an idea that, um, that, Britain's, that Britain's empire, or indeed Britain's imperial past, is, gives it a sort of special uh, position in that way. Um, this, as I've said, is, is something that does link back into 19th century pacifism. Um, and I think it has echoes, for example, of the, the approach, say, of someone like Gladstone, uh, the, you know, these famous speeches on the Bulgarian massacres and his idea that Britain has almost this civilizing mission in terms of world, uh, world politics. When it, comes to, uh, when it comes to the empire and decolonization, this left um, is in favor of that it, in, it, in its more, in its furthest left groupings, quite solidly on, <coughs> on behalf of um, colonial freedom, as it's being uh, phrased. But it also has very much ideas of gradual developmentalism as well. So that the continuity between, between that grouping, particularly, say, the keep left grouping in Parliament and, and, and earlier forms of leftism, I think are much, are much stronger. And I would say that we can see it you know, uh, on into the future. I mean, I mentioned Stop the War because of some of its positions on, um, on the war in Ukraine. I think echo this, particularly on negotiation and collective, uh, collective security. But of course, Keep Left, although they, um, they formed a, a, a block within the Labour Party MPs, and they also um, had a certain amount of support in the constituencies, and, and this is perhaps where their, their cowardice is, um, has a certain echo in the contemporary world. They, they, not only did they not organize uh, to resist uh, tax on them from the labor right and in the press and so forth. But members were expelled, two, two MPs were expelled, Connie Ziliakis and uh, Leslie uh, Solly. And this grouping, uh, although it morphs into other groupings in the 50s, I think is in effect pretty toothless. Um, you know, uh, older comrades will remember some of these names because they were names that were still referred to but they, that their, their politics still, I think, was essentially within this labor framework. And this, I suppose, is, is, is the point about this labor left, that it, it is contained solely within the labor framework. It wants to preserve that instrument. It sees no other way of uh, developing socialism, of socialist politics, than, than staying within, within that framework, not just organizationally, I think, but, but more importantly, politically. I'm going to draw to a close, but just uh, one, because the voice is starting to give out. But one, one thing to, um, one thing just to sort of conclude on about that 45 government, and it's the social imperialist angle, which I've not really looked at. I've mentioned the Korean War, and again, comrades are well aware that the, the Atlee government um, sent British troops to, to fight in that war. It also uh, carried out a rearmament program, particularly in a period when, when state spending was under uh, stretch, particularly the, uh, the sacrifices of elements of the welfare state, which can be linked to, to armament spending, and also maintaining conscription or national service uh, in the face of um, a threatened um, in effect, a sort of military revolt. But of course, it's also nuclear weapons. Remember that Attlee, uh, St. Clement's uh, Attlee, 
He's also the prime minister when the bombs are dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And perhaps more importantly, he establishes more clearly than anybody else, as does that, that Labour government, the junior partner role, I think in, in the phrase that Britain is the most senior of the junior partners of the United States. And in that, there's a great deal of continuity between <coughs> Labour and the Tories. And indeed, if you read Tory memoirs from that period, um, they're full of praise for Ernest Bevin, you know, who's instrumental in setting up institutions like NATO, who's instrumental in a sense of bringing that partnership, American bases, and indeed um, Britain acting as a sort of junior policeman alongside the United States. The other important point in terms of the British Empire and in terms of that government is that Labour does grant political independence to India, but in a way it's bowing to the inevitable. And indeed, there was some huffing and puffing by Churchill and others. But in, in, in essence, India could not be held. And so, you know, was going to be given up. But there were no immediate plans for decolonization of, of, of Africa or the West Indies or other parts of Asia. And so, you know, in those key areas, we, we have a very explicitly social imperialist policy. And one, I think, which lays down the marker for, for British governments in general, not just Labour governments. Um, you may remember um, uh, uh, Boris Johnson's um, uh, valedictory, I wouldn't call it a speech, but it was a bit of a ramble in, in Parliament. And he began with his first phrase to his successor, was stay close to the Americans. Uh, a, a slightly less polite version of that was uh, was given, I think, by Alistair Campbell, um, but I can't remember the exact words, but it would re refer to another part of the anatomy that British ambassadors must maintain close relations with. Um, and that essentially is, has been the, the policy of, of British imperialism. And you might well argue that the Tories would have done it, and that's exactly the point. The Tories would have done it. Um, the fact is that is that that Labour leadership, you know, despite its left reputation, despite our endless discussions about the welfare state, the National Health Service, uh, and so on and so on, is also the party <laughs> of um, imperialism, war, and I think repression uh, in the colonies. So that's the Labour Party. And that, in many senses, is its official left as well. Thanks, comrades.